Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. All right, welcome. Good morning. Glad that you are here as we wrap up the series that we've been doing on marriage today. Why don't you take your Bibles and we'll go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 in the New Testament. And if you need a Bible, why don't you flag down one of the ushers and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those. And if you need to keep it, it's our gift to you. While you're turning to Ephesians 5, I'll tell you about something that happened last week. Among the hundreds of people that I get to shake hands with and greet and so, um, was one individual in, per, uh, in particular who s- s- sort of caught me off guard, pulled me a little bit off to the side and, and said, Pastor Dan's uh, message today r- r- really has me confused. I was thinking, well, I thought it was a wonderful message and it made perfect sense to me. Individual said, because I came here today convinced my marriage is over, it's done. But after listening to the message that he gave on persevering, I find myself confused now. And I find myself wondering if I should stay a little bit longer and work a little bit harder. Well, I found myself thinking, well, I'm gonna cast my vote for the stay a little harder and stay a little longer and work a little harder, if you're asking me. Because over the course of the history of Faith Bridge here, I've just seen so many marriages transformed, which were worn down to the nub. I mean, really unraveling. And then God did something and they, you know, got to some help and got a counselor and began to work on it and, and prioritized it. And I've seen some, some radical transformations and I happen to believe that God's not done doing miracles here at Faith Bridge in marriages. And so, as a matter of fact, for that very reason, we're going to, we, we just thought it would be most appropriate as we finish the series today to do some praying for marriages. And so in a little while, we're gonna come for the Lord's Supper after the message, and we're gonna have prayer partners here as we uh, often do. And I'm gonna invite you to come as you come for the Lord's Supper and let somebody pray for you. Uh, maybe you're, this is a good marriage and you can pray for it to be great. Maybe it's not so good and you could pray for it to be better and for God to do something. And we're just gonna ask God to do some miracles in our midst here in the coming weeks and months. All right, but before we get to that portion in the service, let's look at Ephesians uh, 5. Now, this is a portion of Ephesians 5 that you would not have perhaps been thinking I was gonna talk about. If you're familiar with Ephesians 5, you know a little bit later in the chapter are some verses on marriage that are typically referred right to. It's not the verses I'm looking at today. I wanna look at verse one and two, okay? Let me read Ephesians 5, one and two. Paul writing to the Ephesian Christians. Therefore, he says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, what's he saying here? In this chapter, the apostle Paul is teaching us how to walk in love. And he's giving us two big concepts that we wanna wrap our minds around. He says, you're finally starting to understand love if, number one, your love mirrors God's love for us as his children, and two, if your love mirrors Christ's sacrifice for us. Those are two things I wanna talk about, okay? In his outstanding book, uh, Lifelong Love, that Gary Thomas wrote, and uh, or it, it's gonna be released, I think, this week, actually, but we've had some sneak previews, and I, and I think several hundred of you, about 400 of you, actually have already gotten it. And we've been leaning into this book, and I, and, uh, I know we have a few more. She said about 15 more as I was walking in, so let's get rid of the rest of them, all right? And it's just such a fabulous new gold standard, I believe, in Christian uh, writing for the Christian marriage. But anyhow, Gary talks in this book um, about the, the spider web, and he talks metaphorically, pointing out that everybody is somewhat spider-like when it comes to finding and catching a spouse. We're all that way. We all construct marital webs by attracting a spouse that we believe will meet our needs, okay? 
But, um, but you know how when the light is not right, you can't see a spider web. If you're in a dark garage or something, that's why you walk right into it. The, the light has to be right for you to see the reflection and see that spider web. Well, on the front end of marriage, before people get married, the light isn't right. And you won't typically see the spider webs that somebody else is weaving or the ones that you're weaving as well. For example, when you ask somebody on the front end of marriage, so why do you believe this person would be such a wonderful spouse for you? They'll tend to reply with predictable, uh, somewhat superficial answers. They'll say things like, well, you know, he's just so funny, you know, or she's so outgoing and I'm so shy, you know, or he is so kind, or she is so hot or we get along so well, or it's like we've known each other for years and we only met last week, okay? And, and so clearly the light's not shining quite brightly enough yet for you to see the spider web. It's only after marriage do two people begin to see, oh, here was the web. That only comes to the surface after marriage. That's why when you ask somebody after they've gotten marriage, married, now why was it that you got, what was it that drew you to marriage with this person? You'll get the more honest answers. After marriage, you'll hear somebody say, well, my life was a total mess. And I figured she was together and organized enough to kind of keep an eye on me and get the bills paid. Oh, sounds a little spider-like to me. You know, or well, deep down, I knew he would be a great father for my kids. Hmm. Well, that's a web. Or I sensed he was laid back enough to let me pursue my career path. Hmm. Or I was tired of waiting to have sex any longer and she wanted to be married. Okay, these are the, the real reasons. These are, the, these are the, now you're seeing the spider web. And all of us do this. All of us get married for selfish reasons. All of us have this spider tendency residing inside of us. So those of you who are, who are single, you listen up particularly because you do too. You have these tendencies and so does anybody that you might ever date or marry have these. So it's probably good for you to come into a little self-awareness already be thinking about that. Now, some of you are thinking uh, in your smugness, well, I don't and I wouldn't. I would never do that. To, I would never draw someone into marriage with ulterior or selfish motives. Sure you would. Everybody does. Even the most honest reason for getting married, if nothing more complicated and innocent sounding as just I'm just tired of being single. Okay. Well, that's a web that you're weaving for somebody to fix uh, that problem for you, see? So nobody gets married for entirely selfless reasons. This is the point. Everybody gets married to get their love needs met. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. We're going to do a little exercise. So, so here's, here's what we're going to do in just a moment. Not yet, but in just a moment. I'm going to actually ask you to do something physical. I'm gonna ask you to stand up and to walk. Uh, and you have to be careful. We did it in the first service, it worked great. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. If, if you came into church today, you're like, okay, I know the series is on marriage, he's gonna talk about marriage. I really hope that he'll say something to help my spouse love me better, to pay attention to me more, to be more sensitive to my needs, to love, use my love languages more, to care for me, to serve me more, these kind of things. If, if that's what deep down you're kind of thinking when you're coming into church today, in a minute, not yet. In a minute, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and I'm gonna ask you to walk to this side of the room, okay? On the other hand, if you came into church today <clears throat> and your thought was, I know he's talking about marriage, I hope that he's just gonna teach me something about how to love more like Christ, sacrificially, to lay down my life for my spouse, to serve her, to serve him better. That's really what I'm hoping to get out of the message today. I'm gonna ask you in a moment, not yet, to, to walk to this side of the room, okay? And single people, you get to keep your seat and you got, you know, 50 yard line seats. And so, so, so okay, so here, everybody know kind of, you're going this side, or you have to be kind of careful. You can pick up your purse and take that way. Okay, ready? One, two, no, I'm not, we're not really gonna do that. That would be a train wreck, all right? And, and you know what would happen? Everybody would be on this side of the room if you were honest and the liars would be over here, okay? And, and so, 
So I already know the way that that whole thing could go because all of us at our root are selfish. The, the love me better side of the room would be way tilted heavier because deep down all of us want to find somebody who will love us unconditionally, who will have our backs, who will be 100% faithful even you know, when we're not, who will, who will always be there and forgive us when we falter and just be there unfailingly for us. All of us want that. But here's the question I want you to wrestle with for a second. Is that a job description that anybody could fulfill? Is that a reasonable, is that a realistic job description to give to somebody? To to just say, yeah, 100% of the time, never failingly, always forgivingly, faithfully, never falteringly, you just love me. Is that a a realistic job description? Nobody can do that for you except one. Only God has the capacity to love you that way. And he does love you that way. And all you have to do to see proof of the fact that he loves you that way is to look at the cross. For it was there that our Heavenly Father, seeing us in our brokenness and our fallenness and our dysfunctionality, said not, y'all are a bunch of losers and I'm moving away from you, but rather, I'm gonna come towards you. I'm coming for you. I'm the only one who could heal you and fix you in your brokenness. I'm gonna come towards you and give my life for you. And oh, by the way, I'm never gonna leave you and I'm never gonna forsake you. I'm always going to love you. Okay, that's the gospel that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Christians call good news. So the reality is you are loved by him with a love like you could never find in another person. Okay, you say, okay, but you know, wait, wait, no. what does that have to do with marriage? I thought we came to talk about marriage. Okay, the fact that God, and only God, loves you perfectly means that what you thought your greatest need was to be loved perfectly by somebody else, it's already been met. And there's nothing like it. The uh, the author Brennan Manning, who uh, passed away several years ago, he writes about a priest from Detroit named Ed Farrell, who went on a two-week summer vacation to Ireland to visit his uncle who was turning 80 years old. And so on the birthday morning, Ed and his 80-year-old uncle, they got up early before dawn to take a walk along the shore of Lake Killarney. And they were stopping uh, along the way to watch the sunrise and stood there for about 20 minutes and just watched the sun rise over the lake. And after a while, they they started walking again. Ed looked at his elderly uncle as they started walking again, and they noticed that he just had the broadest, he noticed that he had the broadest smile on his face. And Ed said, Uncle Seamus, you look to me very happy. He said, I am. And he said, well, how come? Why are you so happy? And he said, because the father of Jesus is very fond of me. And I wonder, have you come to experience the fondness of the father of Jesus? Have you let his love soak into your heart such that it just brings a smile to your face? There's nothing like it. The reality that he loves you. And here's how it will change your marriage. Since your need to be loved perfectly by another has been met by our Heavenly Father, you can check that need off your list. It's been met. In other words, you can move on now. 
and for the rest of your life. You don't have to be chasing somebody else to, to love you just the right way. Now you can move on to the greater goal that God has for you to focus upon in your marriage. Something is much more profound than finding a spouse who will meet your love needs just right. Because see, his goal for you in marriage was always something different. It was always to teach you how to love somebody else the way the Father loves us. And there's a world of difference between those two understandings. Don't you see? What's our text say? Again, be imitators of God as his beloved children and walk in love. We're learning to imitate the Father's love towards us as we work on learning how to love our spouse. Now, who's the implied subject in verse two? You, you be an imitator of God and his love. You walk in love. It's essential that you wrap your mind around this goal. We all have to, that, that, that he has for us in marriage to learn to love well, because when you do, well, let's say it this way, until you do, you will grow bitter and resentful in marriage. You show me a person who thinks my greatest need is for my spouse to learn how to do this better, to love me more effectively, to speak my love languages, to serve me more, to on and on and on. You show me that spouse and I'll show you somebody who's always wondering, did I marry the wrong person? On the other hand, you show me a person who truly desires to learn how to love another person as unconditionally as the Father loves us. And I'll show you a person who is much more content with their life and their marriage than the average person. Therefore, be imitators of God as his beloved children and walk in love. Several years ago, uh, Suzanne and I and the boys were up in, in uh, our favorite place to be where we go in the summers <clears throat> in the mountains of Colorado. And one night in uh, particular, the boys probably having brought us to a point of exhaustion had gotten to bed and our irritability turned to, in the direction of each other. And uh, we started sort of saying some hurtful things. I, remember, I don't remember all of it, but I remember two lines in particular. At one point, she finally said, you're just so perfectionistic. It's just exasperating. She said, I'm just thankful I don't work on your staff. And I shot back. I said, well, it's a good thing you don't work on my staff because you probably wouldn't last. I'd probably have to fire you. And, and, and so I share this with you. I've shared this story before, and I don't mind sharing it again because it's good for you to, I think some of you people think that we who serve in ministry full-time, we walk around with little halos on our head during the week. And it's not that way. We're all works in progress, in process. We're all in the process of sanctification, learning how to appropriate the love of Christ into our own lives and in, in our own marriage. And so we shot back and forth a few times. Uh, and the, the next thing I really remember is that we were both lying on the bed and staring at the ceiling, sort of in opposite directions. My head was down by her feet and her head was down by my feet. And we're just staring at the ceiling, furious and pouting. And, um, but up there in Colorado, you know, in the mountains at least, you, you, they don't have air conditioning and you keep the windows open and the breeze, sort of, and, and you can just hear the silence. And we're just lying there in the silence, and, and after a, a, a little while of total silence, I felt the, the nudging of the Holy Spirit s s saying, to, not, not a whole lot, just a little bit, but you have to act on just that little bit that the Holy Spirit gives you, you know, and you have to be faithful with that. And I felt a little nudging of the Holy Spirit to say, you need to, you need to say something. Nice. <laughs> and... <laughs> and I broke the silence. And I said, baby, I'm sorry that I am perfectionistic and I am high, I am high maintenance. And I'm sorry. And she said, well, I'm sorry that I'm not the most organized person in the world. And we said a few other apologetic sort of things. And I remember at some point we, we ended up sort of sitting up and, and facing each other and she said something that was revolutionary for our marriage. 
she looked at me with all the sincerity in the world, no cynicism whatsoever. And she said, Kenny, by the way, don't any of you ever call me Kenny. <laughs> but she can do that. And she said, Kenny, I'm sorry that I'm not exactly the wife that you thought you were marrying. And I pondered that for a minute. And I said, well, baby, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not exactly the husband that you thought you were marrying. Have you ever gotten to that point of honesty where all the swords are sort of put down, but you're just, you're, I'm telling you, that, that was a transformative night and conversation right there at that juncture because we were saying, I'm, I'm going to set this down. I think I've been expecting you to be somebody you're not going to be. And I said, but I love you and I'm committed to you and I'm not quitting. She said, well, I love you and I'm not quitting either. I'm committed to you. And I'm telling you, God walked back into our marriage in that moment because in that moment you had two prideful, strong-willed, highly verbal people who were humbling themselves enough to die to our selfishness and reaffirming and recommitting our love and our commitment each to the other. See, one of the fantastic things about marriage is that it gives us this, this venue, this setting, this situation to work on a marriage. It, 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 it doesn't, it's, and it lasts a long time, Lord willing, it lasts a long time, as long as Pastor Dan's parents, if, if you get good health, what did he say last week, 65 years they're working on. And, and so God puts us in this setting with another person and says, now, the reason I've put you there is yes, you'll have great highs and great victories and great joys and great laughs, but the real reason I've put you there is because you're both sinful and you're both selfish and you've got to have someone in your life that you're gonna practice learning how to be selfless and sacrificial with. That's the real reason. He created this marriage. But see, all of us, we, we want to get out of it. Oh, no, I don't want to do it. Oh, oh, I, I want somebody. See, we all want to go to that side of the room, right? And that's where he says, no, 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 you're, you're, you're missing altogether the higher reason for my creating marriage in the first place. It's to work on you, to give you that situation where you can work on you, the perfect venue for it. Few things are as revolutionary in a marriage as realizing your greatest need is not for your spouse to do better, but rather for you to do better at loving your spouse. Not Hollywood style, but the way that our Father loves us. You say, okay, fine. So how do you do that? Go to verse two, look at Christ. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know you're starting to understand really what love is. He's saying if it mirrors Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. How did Christ bring about our salvation? By leaving nothing on the sidelines, leaving everything on the field, giving it all up for us, for your sake, for my sake. As Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter two. Therefore, you should have the same mindset as Christ Jesus in your relationships with one another. 
who being in very nature with God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now you realize, don't you, that if he hadn't given it all for us, even to death on the cross, there would have never been any ultimate victory. There would have never been any resurrection. There would have never been any hope of salvation for any of us. So let me ask a question, honestly. In your marriage, are you walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us? Is that how you're walking in love towards your spouse? I'll tell you what I notice. I notice, I get talked to a lot of people. The, the problem with so many marriages is it's a mindset problem. Their mindsets are so far from the mindset of Christ who gave us all for us. So many people make defeatist kind of remarks about their marriages. It, and it's a dead giveaway that they're not taking the mindset of Christ. You say, what is a defeatist kind of remark? Things like my husband. He just won't get away from his game console or his football games. Or my wife, she's a hopeless addict to this or that. Or I'm just not happy in my marriage anymore. Or we will never understand each other. Or she changed. After we got married, she just, she changed. Or he changed. After we got married, he changed. Or we're we're just so incompatible now. Depressing, defeatist mindsets. Now here's the question. What if Christ had said that about you and me? Oh, they're just such a mess those people are. They keep changing on me. Just when I think I've got them figured out, they go and change again. You know, I'm just, I'm just so incompatible with them. What if Christ had said that about us? He would have hurt a lot less because he had never come to this earth and he'd never died on a cross. And similarly, he would have never gotten to the resurrection and neither would we have ever gotten to the resurrection. And we would be hopelessly mired in our sins and hell bound throughout eternity. But because he loved us unendingly and endured the cross before him, the resurrection was possible. And hope and joy and resurrection in any marriage is likewise possible but only as you learn, verse two, to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Don't you see the prerequisite for any resurrection is death. You can never have a resurrection unless there's a death. And I'm not talking about the death of your spouse. I'm talking about something else that's gotta die. This means that you're gonna have to crucify your defeatist mindset, your defeatist attitudes. You're gonna have to nail them to the cross. You're gonna have to nail to the cross your marital frustrations. Just get the hammer out and nail those frustrations to the cross. You're gonna have to die to phrases like, I've already tried, it just doesn't work, it's hopeless. You're gonna have to kill those thoughts and nail them to the cross. Don't you see, when you say those things, you don't even have to say them. When you think those things, you're playing right into Satan's hand. He's always been in the business of killing and stealing and destroying. And so you mustn't miss the spiritual battle that's going on in the midst of all of our marriages. If you love Jesus, you can be certain that the devil is coming after your marriage. Spiritual forces are working all the time to tear us apart in our Christian marriages. So we shouldn't be surprised when Satan and the forces of the world fight back at us, beginning with the destruction of our marriages. And, and to say, well, I'm not engaged in that spiritual warfare kind of stuff, to roll your eyes as that, at that, to pretend, well, my marriage isn't under any spiritual attack, is like having a picnic on a battlefield and being surprised when a grenade explodes underneath your picnic table. It's not realistic. We have to take the mindset, the attitude of the Apostle Paul, 
who very regularly said, oh, no, 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 we're in the midst of a spiritual battle, but don't forget this, as he said in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors, we who have Christ. We have supernatural resurrection power. To be more than a conqueror means that whatever problem comes your way, you can overcome it through Christ. You can live with confidence that he loves you no matter what, and he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And that means that when the unexpected happens or when you're disillusioned or when you're disappointed, you don't have to be devastated by it because you know the truth of 1 John 4, 4, that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Nothing is too great for him. Not even the hardest of marriages. I'll tell you one more story. It's a story of a, well, two people here in the church several years ago. He'd been friends, I'd been friends with him for a good while. And he's a, uh, he was a, an addict to pornography and in touch with that reality, giving a half-baked effort to recovery, you know, sort of depending on the season. And... Uh, very flirtatious, had been through several uh, marriages, but then meets the one and says, I'm going to get married. Oh, my goodness. Again, yes. This time it's really, it's going to be different. Really? And uh, so they got married. Well, it didn't take long. It wasn't going to be that different. Why? Because he's still flirtatious with people and he's still a porn addict. and, And he goes off and he has another extramarital affair. And when it all exploded, I remember the day when it just, it all exploded and came into the light and and it was like for the first time, he really realized, what am I doing? I just keep doing this same cycle over and over. And he said to one or two of us on the staff, "I, I wanna change. And there was something in his earnestness that said to us, no, this time it's maybe a little bit different. We were, you know, suspect, but he seemed really, really earnest. And so Pastor Dan said, well, if you mean that, then I think you should probably go to this inpatient um, recovery program for sex addicts. I don't see how you can make progress until you deal with that. And, um, And he went. I mean, just packed up and just went. And his wife was prevailed upon. Don't, don't, she was disgusted, just ready to be done and throw him out. But wait, wait, wait just wait. Just, maybe God's wanting to do something inside of you as well as in him to teach both of you something, to heal something in both of you. And so she said, I, I, I'll take a wait and see approach. And he came back a month or two later after the impatient program and enrolled himself instantly into the local SA program here and began going dutifully every day, at least once a day, sometimes two times, sometimes three times a day to, to sex addict meetings. And they set up a system of accountability and communication and transparency. He would call her several times in the day, here's where I am, here's what's going on, and I love you. And, and, and slowly but surely, we watched as her rightful rage Uh, sort of melted and was converted into this Christ-like love. And as he dealt with the demons that had been gliding along in the subterranean of his soul since childhood, uh, we saw this transformation that was happening in him. And they went through months and months of work and counseling and painful things and tears and bringing up stuff and forgiving stuff and releasing one and transparency, the likes of which you rarely see in any married couple. Such total openness, such total transparency. And I was thinking about them uh, as I was working on this message because I just saw them just the other day hand in hand, just as happy as they can be. How are you all doing? And they said, we're doing great. And I know that they are really doing great. In fact, God's even using them to help some other couples that are 
really not doing great that are kind of where they have been. And they can speak into that. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I think it illustrates perfectly what we've been talking about. Two sinful people, one whose sins were more conspicuous than the others, but neither get off uh, scot-free. We're all infected by sin. Two sinful people who took all of that stuff and just nailed it to the cross and learned how to soak in the love of God and to walk in that love as Christ loved us. We watched it happen, and as sure as I'm standing here, theirs is a transformed marriage. So you'll be hard-pressed to convince me that any marriage is beyond hope. That's why I want us to pray in just a few minutes for every marriage. We're gonna come to the Lord's table. Let me just remind you of what it is that what we're celebrating here is that that sacrifice of Christ that we've been talking about, that when he came to this earth, uh, finally he got to the point for which he had ultimately come. And he said to his disciples, now I'm going to go to the cross and I'm gonna die for you. And this is my body and it's broken for you. And I want you to take it and I want you to eat it. And as you do, you remember the sacrifice that I'm making for you. It's a tangible way that we can access the memory instantly of what he did for us 2,000 years ago. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And I want you to take it. And as you do, you're gonna remember me. You're gonna remember what I did for you. And so in just a few moments, the ushers are gonna lead you forward and you're gonna find some stations in both rooms uh, up front, the bread is already broken into the baskets and uh, we use grape juice here at Faith Bridge that, that's in the chalices and the ushers will lead you in just a few moments and you'll come forward and take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup and then you can partake. And then I hope that you'll also take some time for prayer. You can always kneel on the steps and pray in either room wherever you are. Um, but we're gonna have the prayer partners up here. And in the first service we had a lot of people who just said, would you pray for me? Let me tell you four quick categories that you might solicit one of those prayer partners to pray for you. The first one might be uh, just a personal prayer. Would you pray for me to die to my selfishness? That might be the prayer you need to have somebody just pray over you. That might be your takeaway for today. Maybe you're with your spouse and you, and you just say, would you just pray for our marriage? Pray that we'll go from good to great or not so good to better or, you know, just wherever you are, just, just, just that, why don't we just ask for prayer for that? If you're single, maybe your, your prayer request, you just say, would you just pray for me in my singleness? Maybe that I'll be content, that I'll just be content in singleness. Or if I am thinking about marriage or someday I am, uh, get, that I'll have wisdom. Um, about that and then maybe a fourth category and that's if you're divorced and a message like this sometimes can bring up some hurt and some painful memories and some e even bitterness and, and some things like that and I don't think the Lord wants anybody to go out of here feeling hurt and, and, and bitter and I, I think he wants you to go out soaking in his love the father of Jesus is very fond of of you. Why don't you just tell a prayer partner, would you pray for me about that? So in a moment, the ushers will lead you. Oh, and I forgot the gluten-free elements are over there and you just come as they lead you. Let me pray first. Lord, thank you for the chance to come and to look at your word for the, um, the counsel that is so timeless to think that a man named Paul could write the words that we looked at several thousand years ago, and they're still entirely salient, they're still entirely relevant, they're still entirely true and helpful, and they're, they're just what we need, all of us, in our lives, and particularly in our marriages. And so, Lord, my prayer 
today is that you would meet with us now as we come to commune with you in these final minutes of the service. As we come and take the bread and the cup and just remember in a tangible way the sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, won't you come and just meet with us through the power of your Holy Spirit? And I pray, God, that we would see the beginning of more miracles happening here. There have been so many over the years, transformative stories, inspiring tales of people who were spiraling, unraveling, and it was bad. And then you just built it back, God, stronger than it ever was. I pray, God, that today would be the beginning of that for uh, I don't even know how many people, countless, and that you'll just do a work. And that those who came here today saying, well, my marriage isn't so bad, it's actually rather pretty good, that you'd just take it from good to great. And uh, even from one mountaintop to a higher mountaintop yet. So won't you work now as we come in these moments and as we commune with you, And we pray all these things in your strong name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Wayne Risher, and I'm sitting here with Ken Werlein, Senior Pastor of Faithbridge Church, who just wrapped up another terrific message on marriage. So welcome, Ken, to Postscript. We're glad to have you. So as you know, Postscript is an interactive time where we have some questions. Folks are interested in going a little deeper in study. So uh, looks like we have three questions today we'd like to, to press into, see how we go with that. So during the sermon, Ken, you mentioned a little situation with you and Suzanne in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, in response to Suzanne, you said, I love you, I'm committed to you, I'm never quitting, Mm -hmm. which is the same thing that God says to us. And one of the points you said was uh, loving us as God loves us. We convert that over. So what is the next step then? Once you've said that, you've demonstrated the love, is sacrifice the next piece? Sure. Well, when you move to verse 2, then you're moving to the, the Christ aspect of it. And that has to do with the cross and the crucifixion. And the only way you're going to ever get to a resurrection is through the crucifixion. Something's going to have to die. So, you know, I felt like I talked enough about our story in that instance. But let me stay with that illustration to just expand upon it. So someone asks, well, how do you really die to something? Well, I'll stay with my perfectionistic tendencies, which can grate on anybody, people that I work with as well as people that I am at home with. And that's just the way I'm, I'm wired. It's just, but, uh, and to some extent, I probably can't change that. Um, but that does not mean that I must not die to the way that I'm handling that or dispensing that or visiting that on other people. That's where I've had to have several things. I've done some personal counseling on that, actually meeting with a a therapist and a counselor to try to figure out what, what, what is your drive in there? What, what's going on, you know, about that? I think that's an important aspect in my journey. And then having some honest friends, friends here at the church, accountability brothers, um, and then certainly Suzanne, who will just speak truthfully and saying, hey, you're going overboard. You're, you're too wound up. And through doing that over and over and over the wrong way, where you have to own it and repent and confess and apologize and you do that enough times, you start to learn oh, how to get out in front right. of those impulses before you say what you're going to say. Um, and, and so it's just a process. Uh, unfortunately, in this instance, it hasn't been a, a quick death, but I think it's more dead than it was 15 years ago. Uh, and I'm still moving on in further sanctification in, in that area. Um, 
but for most of, I mean, sometimes God really does a, a, a zappo transformation and somebody never had the thought again, or they never had the urge again, or they never, praise the Lord when that happens. This hadn't come about that way. This has been more of a methodical, I, I regularly have to be reminded, okay, this is sort of what rears its ugly head when you're fatigued, when you're kind of worn out. You've got to watch, for, you've got to kill that. Kill it, kill it, crucify it, or else you're going to hurt somebody. You've done this enough times, you don't want to have to do that again and repent and apologize. And, you know. So it's methodical. Yeah. So it's, it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, I, I like that in process. When, when would it not be appropriate for me to die to self? When, when is that boundary yeah. exhausted? Yeah, and that's a great, a great question. On the one hand, never. We're, we're always called to die to ourselves. We're always called to forgive. How, Jesus, 70 times seven, how many times should I forgive, Lord? Seven times, that's huge, right? No, Jesus says 70 times seven. So on the one hand, no. Now, on the other hand, I would be concerned about one category of people hearing a message like this. And that would be the abused person. Okay. The person who's being, the, the wife who's being battered uh, or, or s s sexually abused or something along those lines. And I know, unfortunately, of situations where that type of abuse happens in the name of Christ, where you have typically the male doing, you know, thus and so and saying, you know, I'm doing this because I'm the leader of the home and I'm the ruler of the family and, you know, no whammo. And well, in that instance, loving unconditionally and loving sacrificially might need to look a little bit different. Um, specifically how? Well, this person clearly has some sort of issue going on inside their own soul that has not been dealt with. And so by just being abused repeatedly, uh, we're enabling this person to continue in his dysfunction mm. and just to continue to do these things that are not God honoring, even though he might say this is honoring God. It's not honoring God or ch child abuse or these sorts of, it's not honoring God. So the way uh, that we're gonna need to love sacrificially and unconditionally in that instance is uh, to, to build some space in. I think of how King David uh, of old would play his harp, and uh, but then King Saul, you know, would be overcome with this rage, and he'd start throwing his spears at King Saul. And well, David would scamper on. You know, you you have to get out of the way. If the spears start coming your direction, you you need to go ahead and take your take your harp and and, and scoot. And so I think it's important to say in some instances, the way that we're gonna love most conditional, unconditionally and sacrificially is to build in some space, to bring in a community, mm -hmm. to see, is this healthy? Is what's going on? Maybe to bring in an authority. Is this healthy? What's going on here? Is this normal? It feels normal to me because it's how we've done it for so many years, but is this right? Is this healthy? Is this normal? No, probably in that instance, we're going to need to, to, to do something else. And probably this person uh, is going to need to learn more correctly what it means to love like Christ because he's not doing it, even though he may think he's doing it. Um, so I would just add that caveat because I'm always concerned for the, you know, out of several thousand people, you're going to have a handful who are in abusive situations. And I would not want them to misinterpret the message as just a, okay, well, I just got to go back and get slugged some more um, in the name of Jesus. Um, that, that would be a, a gross misunderstanding of... That, that's of, a good, healthy yeah. answer, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's move for a minute to one other group. Okay. okay. Let's say that I'm single okay. uh, or I'm unmarried. I'm at some station of life and I was married and now I'm, now I'm finding myself single. You mentioned this spider web of things I want in a future spouse and I, uh, these things. So if you take those uh, and, and I say, I, I don't want to weave a web like this to catch someone, uh, what filter do I use then for the next person? Do I, do, what am I looking yeah. for? Well, I mean, to some extent, you, you can't help yourself. You will weave a web. <laughs> um, 
mm-hmm. there, there is something that is drawing you towards another person. And so you're going to weave your web and the other person's going to weave their web. And that, that dynamic is just something that's built into the attraction aspect of how God has wired us. I'm convinced to get us in that dynamic where then we can start to work on our selfishness. So to some extent, you'll not be able to avoid it. But there is a question that maybe lies underneath what I think you're asking. And that is, uh, how do I make sure that I don't catch the wrong person Mm -hmm. or that I don't get caught Mm -hmm. in the web of somebody else? Um, And I would say several things. Uh, Certainly, the, the, the further along, the older I get, the more I go cut straight to the quick and ask somebody who's excited about the person they're dating, tell me about their walk with Jesus. Mm. I, I used to tiptoe about, you know, do they go to church? Sometimes they go to church. No, 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 no. I, I want to I wanna know, do they, tell me about their walk with Jesus. Because I know you have a vibrant walk with Jesus. And if they don't have a walk with Jesus, then you have any business getting any further into this thing. Uh, I've just seen too many train wrecks that uh, way. Your, your odds are stacked way against you. So I want to know uh, about, uh, to, to, let's talk about the Lord and your walk with the Lord and his or her walk with the Lord. And then I think there's, there's great value, and God's word tells us there's great value in community. All right. that's, that's the whole reason, well, not the whole reason, but one of the great reasons that he's given us this community so that when one is weak, the other can be strong and strengthen us and speak truth to us. I'm thinking of a person who even uh, shared with a dear, dear friend, no, I'm se- not in these words, but she could have said, I'm seeing spider webs that you're not seeing. <laughs> don't marry the person. Don't marry the person. Don't marry the person. But she went ahead and married the person, overriding her, her friend's counsel. Mm-hmm. Well, she regrets it. The friend was able to see the webs. Right. Good. And community can because the angle is such in, in the, the, the lighting is such so, if you will, that they can see the webs. And, they're, you know, dear friend of mine, you're not seeing something and we're seeing this and we just feel like we have to tell you. And hopefully you, if you're the single person, will be humble enough to say, well, it's not what I want to hear but I love you and I know of your friendship and your love for me and your commitment to me over all of these years uh, enough that I'm going to listen to that and I'm going to slow this down. So I would really lean heavily into community. Just having, and it's one of the reasons that Suzanne and I felt so good about moving forward in our marriage. I was an old guy by then. I was 35. She was 30. And so we weren't just out of college. We both had some relationships ourselves, uh, uh, you know. But there was something about the community of several key people who knew us both Mm -hmm. and were speaking, um, you know, into both of our lives. And it's, it's very bolstering. Yeah, that's good wisdom. Well, thank you so much for the clarification and going a little deeper on these questions. So that's good. And thank you for joining us for Postscript. I hope you'll be back next week as we have Ben Stewart uh, with us at Postscript. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.